It's time to hear about Dharavi. And we have two presentations on Dharavi this afternoon. The first from Mukesh Mehta, who is chairman of MM Consultants. Please. Join us. Please turn off your mobile phones and blackberries. Mr. Chairman, Co-Chairman, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it's truly an honor and a privilege for me to be here today. And in some ways, I feel that describing or, or demonstrating what the Dharavi project is all about is somewhat like a bottle of fine wine. Ten minutes is simply not enough to cover all the, uh, absorb all the complexities. I'll try my best. I'm involved with Dharavi project for the last 10 years. At that time, I had more hair and they were all black. For the last four and a half years, I'm involved with the government of Maharashtra on this project. And at that time, it was perceived that the project will take off in six months after we started. And it's four and a half years, and now we are just about to take it off. And that's because the government has been very, very sensitive to the fact that all the stakeholders should be, uh, 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 should be interacted with, and we had to be very sensitive to their needs. And that's what we have been doing for the last four and a half years. My very first office... I'm sorry, before these 10 years, I used to build expensive custom homes in Long Island, New York. And after having come here, I have started working on the Haravi project, which is the other end of the spectrum. So my son thinks I'm very versatile, and my wife thinks I'm very confused. And I'm going to do my best not to confuse you all. In order to understand the Haravi, I uh, and the project about 10 years ago, I set up my very first office in Dharavi for about six months because I did not, about 10 years ago, I had no understanding about poverty, about the way slum dwellers lived, etc. And if I was, was going to invest in the project and if I was going to be a developer there, I needed to be sure that I was uh, fully conversant with the local ethos. And amongst the things that I saw in those six months, changed my mindset quite a bit. So originally where I had come there as a developer to try to exploit, to, to try to cash in on every real estate opportunity available, I found there people who were extremely hardworking, starting their days from as early as 5 or 6 in the morning, ending their days uh, 11, 12, whatever, and still just barely making their, uh, their sort of uh, livelihood. And I found that these were very hardworking, very honest, very decent people. And they simply deserved better. The sad part is that though they are called encroachers, they themselves are in fact paying for the, the abode that they have and subhuman abode for that matter. And at some point, I related them to myself. I realized that they're not very different from my father. My father came from a very small village in Gujarat, and he lived in a very small room in a chawl, as they call in India, in Ghatkopar. Luckily for me, before I was born, he had made his fortune. And he had moved into a huge mansion with tennis courts, etc. So I had really not understood what poverty was all about. But then I saw this bunch of people that I was dealing with who were who were, who were in, in Mumbai, having broken their shackles from the villages, come here, aspire for better lives. And having spent 10 years in the U.S., I started comparing them not, not very differently from the migrant population that the U.S. has. And I started telling myself that look at the way developed countries can really develop human resources. Look at the way a villager from Vietnam or a villager from India or Pakistan or Sri Lanka can go to US or UK or Canada or, and so many other developed countries, and they can, over a period of time, integrate with the mainstream. And what do they do that can make people integrate with the mainstream? And essentially, the, the, 
the buzzword that architects, urban designers use is sustainability, sustainability, sustainability all the time. Very frankly, I've used that word, but I had no understanding of it till I got into the Harabi. And I started evaluating what that sustainability would mean for the people of Dharavi. Five minutes already over. Gosh. All right, I'm going to just rush through this. <laughs> Fine bottle of wine. Uh, this, is, this is some of the pictures of Dharavi. Please. I'm not, I'm not getting into the past history of slums where I feel that Housing has been addressed as the issue, and at the end of the day, we wound up creating vertical or concrete slums, and the overall sustainability has not been achieved, including, in my opinion, the present SRA rules, which allow for housing, but which do not account for the other uh, requirements, which is the, the sustainability uh, issues, which I will I'll, uh, bring. I think we'll, we'll bring the slide straight to uh, uh, just, just move fast so that I have uh, more time on the... Mm. Yeah, this is the way the present slum scheme is being implemented throughout Mumbai, and which is definitely going to create vertical slums, in my opinion. If you have almost uh, 1 lakh and 50,000 or 150,000 or 200,000 homes being built like this, and this is in Dharavi. Fortunately, the government has decided not to go ahead with this kind of development anymore. Don't go that fast. Uh, go, go back one slide, please. Detailed plain table surveys have been uh, undertaken and which demonstrates the next slide. How many homes are above 225? How many? Uh, uh, 225 is, is like the magic number because the government says that they'll give only 225 square feet space to, to the slum dwellers. So we've defined how many fall within that, how many are higher, how many are lower etc. To understand the complexity again. And this is the encroached, uh, the, the, the hatch line that you see is the encroached portion which is all slums and you'll find that even uh, areas which were originally reserved for uh, gardens, playgrounds, etc. are all still encroached and there's a negligible amount of space open left. Move. And right now the existing conditions is per capita is, is uh, 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 as you see in white, for buildable reservations and un unbuildable reservations. And you'll find that the blue is what we are proposing, which is significantly higher per capita than what exists already. We'll move on. Yeah, move on. Move on. Now we've proposed instead a master plan. We have limitations because we cannot get rid of the existing structures. We have to retain whatever were the existing reservations. Then uh, 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 we have to also ensure that we do not move slum dwellers from one sector to another. So there are a lot of interactions that we took which brought about the limitations. And finally, we arrived at the plan where essentially we are saying sustainability to us is providing high quality of facilities for health, for income, for knowledge, for environment, and for socio-cultural development, and we've coined the word called hikes for all of this five. And we are essentially saying that mainstream people and slum dwellers must share these uh, amenities so that at some point of time, the most important thing is we have to integrate slum dwellers with mainstream. Uh, as, as I feel that we've been fortunate, I've been fortunate. Move on, please. We find that in this, it's a win-win for all because the slum dwellers get better quality housing with high quality of infrastructure. The government gets all of this for free. And in fact, the developer pays. Apart from that, the government will also get a premium for the first time in slum projects. So a liability has been converted into an asset and future taxes, etc. The citizens now get a brand new suburb which they have not been uh, able to use. Service providers, we are, we are bringing in public-private partnership even in service providers. Political leadership obviously benefits because their vote bank remains intact and the developers benefit because they have a ready-made project uh, in that. So unless you have a win-win situation, projects I don't believe can take off. We have been accused of not providing enough information. This is the kind of 16 different agencies that we've had to get our project vetted through. 
and I wish I could have described this in detail. And these are the kind of pamphlets, 60,000 of these, five, uh, uh, 500 of these, and about 30, 40 of these posters have been distributed, and more than 200 meetings within Dharavi with the slum dwellers to interact uh, uh, with them. And of course, the international and the local media has uh, played a vital role in uh, not only informing the local people, but also the international community. And the project st status is that uh, we're ready to go. We are finally, uh, uh, we have the final shortlisting of 26 bidders, which might further get shortlisted. And within a week or 10 days, that will be clear. And we have major service partners in doctors, in educators, in uh, 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 businessmen. Uh, this is going to be the first eco-housing criteria suburb uh, in India, uh, working closely with USAID. Uh, cultural complexes, etc. The most important thing is mainstream people and slum dwellers will be using similar facilities uh, side by side where the slum dwellers will not be paying for it and the mainstream people will in fact be paying for it. I wish I had more time. Thank you.